me well. Uh, my name is Martin Gajarski. I'm a game system designer at Pixel Federation. And today I'd like to tell you how we design the next generation of free to play game economies. Uh, and most of the presentation will be about our flagship title, Train Station 2. Uh, but I will also go into our cur other current games and also what we are planning for the future. So what you're about to see in this presentation is how we designed a durable game economy of Train Station 2. That means then an economy that keeps players engaged and monetizing for many years. Second, how we try to replicate the, the success with our uh, second game, Port City. And third, uh, based on these learnings, what is our strategy for our upcoming Tycoon games? Uh, before I start a bit about me, I've been the lead designer for both Train Station 1 and Train Station 2 for the last couple of years, and I specialize in system design and monetization. And uh, currently, uh, and recently, I transferred to our R&D department to work on an upcoming game. A bit about our company. Uh, Pixel Federation is the largest game developer in Slovakia with over 300 employees. Uh, all of them are in Bratislava, so here. And we have achieved 50 million revenue in 2021. And currently, we have seven live games. All of them are either in the transport tycoon genre or in the puzzle and story genre. And all of them are free to play mobile games. And the game I'm going to talk about the most is Train Station 2. So it's a rail transport tycoon available for mobile, launched in 2019 after two years of development. And it has over 35 million lifetime registrations and over 45 million lifetime revenue since its release and one third of that is from video ad, rewarded video ads and to give you a better idea how the game looks like here's a short clip i hope it works can see the core gameplay basically revolves around uh, dispatching trains around these scenic landscapes to complete various jobs and contracts, build up cities, industry, railroads and so on. And at the same time, the player collects various historic trains. Most of them are realistic, so there's like a realistic angle to that. And one of our inspirations for the uh, graphic style of the game was not, was not as much realism, but these sort of dioramas that the train collectors have in their basement. So tiny railroads, if you know what I'm talking about. Yeah. Before we get to train station two, I would like to talk about game economy design basics well, and a few definitions, but nothing too long. So a game economy is a virtual economy that configures all game loops in the game, currencies, time loops, XP levels, pricing, and so on. And a good game economy, I think, is crucial for long player engagement and for good monetization. So you can have like the most exciting game, best uh, player fantasy, uh, best theme, but without a good game economy, a free-to-play game will probably never be able to monetize as well as you need. And uh, having a good depth of economy supports all monetization formats, which is important. So that means all in-apps, rewarded videos, offer walls, and so on. And uh, what does it mean to have a deep economy? A deep economy is one where the player is able to collect and spend game resources on meaningful and entertaining actions for a prolonged period of time. So it's basically the oppos uh, opposite of grinding, where you just do one thing every day and you get bored. You need to have lots of resources and lots of places to spend them uh, in various ways. So the game is uh, entertaining for a long time. 
Now let's get to TS2 economy design. So uh, when we were designing Train Station 2, we tried to ask ourselves a couple of questions about the economy design of the game. And uh, we were doing it basically, we were like feeling it. We didn't have like a, a set structure, but in the end, this helped us to formulate our um, game development strategy also for future projects. So it went something like this. So the first question we ask is why would the player want to progress in the game for a long time? Uh, this is a question towards motivators, about which I will talk about later. The second question is, what will they uh, do to progress in the game? So, what will be the activities or the specific mechanics to uh, with regards to the motivators? The third question is, what will they be willing to pay for in the game out of the economy? Like, uh, there will be probably sections of it that will be more favorable to monetization and more attractive for the players to spend money. And the fourth uh, question or thing to consider is when you have all the economy set out, if it will support and cooperate with the player fantasy and make sense to the audience. So an example of this is, for instance, in RPG games where you kill monsters and they drop random loot, it makes sense because it's, it's something you could realistically believe in a real life setting. You kill a monster and it had some treasure on it. But for instance, in train station, what we did, what I consider a mistake that with the, the player acquires trains by dropping loot boxes and he gets a random train. And this a bit breaks the fantasy a bit because uh, in a real life setting, you would probably buy a specific train or build it or research it and not just get a random one. So I think this is pretty important for the economy to work. So, and here are some of the answers for train station two. So the motivators for the game are to grow cities, industry and infrastructure and to collect trains. Those are the major ones. The main mechanics are manage and upgrade trains, transport and produce resources and complete orders and various tasks. And for monetization, we were planning for, for the collection of trains to be the most important part of the monetization and secondarily to speed up production and completing quests. Uh, a thing to consider with regards to the uh, is your audience when designing an economy. So for train station, for both train station one and two and most of our tycoon games, the audience are usually older males. For train station, it's 90% males, 70% are over 45 years of age. So all the guys, usually from Western Europe and the US, they love collecting trains. Uh, they are persistent players, so they don't get bored after one month if we manage to attract their attention. They prefer simple systems because they haven't grown up with complex games like we did probably, but they, in many cases, train station is their first or first game or the only game they play or a game they play after a long time. So we cannot go too complex because it would scare them off. And they usually, since they are older, they already have, uh, they are financially well off. They either have good paying jobs or pensions in the West which allow them to spend significant amounts on the game to collect their trains and so on. And uh, funny thing is that we need to make the UI pretty large and easily to read because uh, they have bad eyesight because of the age. So if we put a font that is too small in the game, we get complaints from the players. So you need to consider your audience every time you design anything in the game. And... Uh, so this is all nice, like this is like a big picture design philosophy, but uh, probably the strongest impulse for us when designing Train Station 2 was trying to fix the problems of Train Station 1, a prequel. So Train Station 2 is a follow-up to this game. Uh, Train Station 1 was our first successful game for Pixel Federation and the design was very, wasn't um, too systematic because we were trying many things. And because of that, there were many, many problems in the game uh, which we were aware of and we wanted to address in the sequel. So on top of all that theoretical stuff I talked about before, a really strong motivator for Train Station 2 was to fix the problems of Train Station 1. And here's a list, uh, which I'm not going to go through in detail here, but here are some of the main problems of Train Station 1, which we try to address with the economy design of Train Station 2. And um, I will go through some of the most important ones with also like illustrations. 
So for instance, with TrainStation 1, a huge problem was power, power creep. Uh, you probably know that term. It means ever increasing numbers. The, for instance, you started out with a train that could have like four wagons of cargo and you end up with a train that had like 200 or you started with 1000 gold or these kinds of numbers and you ended up in the billions and trillions after a couple of years. So this made it very hard for us to balance the game across all the progression brackets. So when we were doing, for instance, an event, we weren't able to set up the numbers to be challenging enough for all players. For some, it was too easy. For others, it was too hard, even when we did like brackets. So a solution for this, which turned out to be very successful and had many benefits, was creating tiered progression, uh, which you can see here. So basically, instead of having one large progression throughout the game, the player uh, moves along various regions of the world. And at the start of each region, his progress is partially reset. So it looks something like this. This is our first region, uh, Great Britain, and this is how it starts. It's basically like a green meadow with nothing on it. And as the player progresses throughout the game, he slowly builds up infrastructure along the map, like bridges, mines, cities, and so on. And he also starts with a small fleet of trains, like three trains with an average capacity of four cargo. And he ends up with an average capacity of 60 and about 20 trains. But after this happens, he moves along to the next region, which is Germany and his train fleet is reset so he starts again with a fleet of about three trains with four cargo and he needs to build up the region again uh, he is able to take some of the things with him but most of the most significant items in the game like the trains are reset and he needs to start over so um, this actually works pretty well we were a bit worried that uh, there will be trouble with motivation for the player to start over but actually uh, it's not a big of a problem because what they care about is the collection of the trains and they still have them and the power they carry is not that important. It's important to have like the physical uh, or the train in your collection and uh, it doesn't matter that the power decreases. It also has many other benefits. For instance, it allows us to balance events and uh, game activities for the whole range of progression using basically the same numbers because a player who has been in the game for two years has 60 power trains in the in the last region while which is the same as in the first region if you i hope this was you could understand this uh, another problem we faced was resource inflation it's a common problem for many long-running games it basically means that over time as the players progress they accumulate a large amount of in-game resources, usually some sort of gold or something else. And then when we try to create a challenge for them, it's basically impossible because they have so much that you cannot uh, create a reasonable challenge because they've been playing for accumulating for like five years and they aren't able to, they wouldn't even be able to spend that resource in uh, throughout the, like a month long event. And on the other hand, if someone has been in the game for a short time, it's impossible for them to uh, complete the milestones as well. So uh, a common solution for this is using uh, limiting, a limiting resource. That means a resource that is basically available only every couple of hours or under certain conditions. And this allows you to know almost exactly how much the player has at a certain point in, in their progression or after a couple of days. For instance, in our game, you can get gold from cities by transporting passengers and it's only available every couple of hours. So we know that like after two days, he already has had the possibility to get this much gold and so on. Another good solution to resource inflation is uh, dividing your, uh, creating as many currencies as possible. So, uh, having many currencies and having one currency serve only one purpose. That is also important. So as soon as you allow one currency to be spent in multiple places, like for instance, gold for trains and buildings and uh, whatever, whatever uh, city expansion, you are losing control over how much the player is receiving and how much he is spending because he can be spending it all in one place and not in the other place. 
but if you have like if you uh, follow the principle of having just one sink per one resource uh you usually know how much you give the player and how much he is spending or you can have like multiple that do one purpose uh, so for instance in train station we have gold plus plus upgrade parts for trains and materials and city plans for buildings you can also have resources which don't follow this uh rule but you cannot balance your progression around them they are just like basically like junk or they are uh, they are just to spend the player's time but you cannot give you any information about the progression of the player uh another huge problem for train station one was that we needed uh, to produce a whole a large amount of content on a weekly basis actually so every week we put in new trains into the game so the players were able to spend money on them and we don't we didn't want to repeat this process because it required a lot of manpower and it basically took up most of the development time which could have been used for uh, new features or maybe some new interesting mechanics or player research so what we did for train station 2 we tried to add uh, more depth into uh, to each train and uh, that basically meant creating an upgrade system for a train so here you can see a player's train collection for the region of usa and you can see on the top right of each train card the power the train has and he needs to spend a lot of resources to get the train from the lowest power to the highest one which basically takes up most of his uh, playtime in the game or it's basically his main goal in the game so this is just like an illustrative graph how much time and resources it takes to take to get a new train with basic power and how much uh, it takes to get a fully upgraded train so uh, we have been able basically to extend the period what the player uh, is required to upgrade the train significantly compared to tra train station one and this allowed us to produce much fewer trains uh, yeah, maybe i don't need to go through all of this i will check the time oh i think it's fine actually uh, another problem was that we needed to produce too much con uh, for the content problem a solution were using loot boxes to uh, reward the player with progression uh, for resources required for progression so for instance the upgrade parts to upgrade the trains from the previous slides are de delivered through loot boxes which are available every couple of hours and this is also like a limiting resource because we know exactly or approximately how much resources he has gathered throughout his gameplay time another solution to the content problem which you probably know about are adding uh side loops so even though we are a trained game we also added like a ship trade loop which extends the possibilities of the gameplay for the player so he doesn't go through the content as quickly and it's cheaper to do a side loop than to create maybe new levels for the player or new trains or what have you because the player just needs to uh, change the action he does in the game this is a pretty common solution and this is another side loop which is the city construction loop where the player is required to upgrade buildings and receive higher population so even with all this um a problem with free-to-play games is creating motivation for the player to spend because usually he is not limited in any way in his progression so if he wants to play the game for one month or if he wants to complete the progression in one month it is possible but if he wants to play for five years at a slow pace it's also possible there is no damage done and it's pretty hard to force players to play more intensely but you can motivate the most the biggest achievers to compete against each other so a feature which i think would work in almost every free-to-play game uh, regardless of the team it doesn't have to be like a combat game it can be really relaxing is adding competitions and these competitions aren't like they're the players are not damaging each other they are simply completing competing uh, in who works the fastest yeah so there is like a significant minority of players who are engaged by this they like playing the game and when they see like this sort of competition sheet they basically want to get to the top and have the highest score and get a small reward 
So I think this is like an extremely cheap solution to motivate your players to spend more. We have also data that uh, clearly confirms that the start of a competition is always one of our strongest monetization days. And we have like two competitions per week. They last like two or three days, which creates short cycles of engagement and monetization. So you can play one competition for three days, then you take a break and next week you come and also play for three days and still we get uh, to engage the players quite a lot and they monetize. So I can I highly recommend this for almost any game you work on. And so with all these changes, the result were two significantly different game economies between TrainStation 1 and 2. As I mentioned, oh, is there a pointer here? Oh, right. Cool. Uh, so as I mentioned, the TrainStation 1 was very dependent on content for monetization. So this is this bar. So 95% basically was content for the gem spent. And this is for TrainStation 2. So we were able to get it to like a very small amount. And most of the monetization is focused on uh, getting resources and speeding up trains. So both of these are mechanics, which we don't need to produce more of. And this has allowed us to like significantly decrease the amount of content that we need to produce. So, and here's also like the result in numbers. So for TrainStation 1, it took 10 years to get to 40 million, while for TrainStation 2, it only took three years. And for TrainStation 1, we needed 4,000 trains and 60,000 in-game items, sort of, sort of decorations, building and so on. And for TrainStation 2, we only needed 400 trains, so 10 times fewer and almost no other in-game items. And also 100 events for TrainStation 1 and only 20 for TrainStation 2. So as you can see, it's a huge difference that we were able to achieve thanks to these changes I have mentioned. Uh, here is a sort of simple evaluation, all of those things I have talked about. After the release, we evaluated every change, if it was successful or not. And most of them we consider a success, at least to a degree. Uh, and there were only a few which we consider uh, that didn't work. Oops, excuse me. So uh, the biggest success was probably tiered progression, which is something we want to include in most of our future games. That's the progression between regions, then limiting resources, more resource types, and almost everything I mentioned was at least partially successful. And what we consider uh, a failure or that didn't live up to our expectations were the side loops the ship loop and the city building loop. Uh, we are still researching what are the reasons, but it's probably has something to do with the motivations of the players. They came to play the game because it has trains in it and they are not that interested in spending their time and money to play with a ship or to play with a city because they are first and foremost train fans. And it also slows down progression and all of our uh, attempts to boost these side loops have resulted in failure. We were able to get the players to play uh, them for a longer time, but we weren't able to make them pay for them. So we were basically reducing our revenue by diverting the players' atten attention to these loops. And one thing that we could uh, be better at is still motivation to spend, which I will explain in a while. So. Even with the competitions, we, we thought we still needed to motivate monetization more. And what we did was adding content events. So things like summer event or steampunk event. It's basically uh, another region in the game with time limited content. So the player has, for instance, one month to build up a region in the game, which has like an attractive topic like steampunk or space or dinosaurs or whatever. And uh, this is something we have a, long, a lot of experience in Pixel Federation. Basically, all of our games are event-based and produce events on a regular basis. And what's the uh, upside of events is that they fill the role of side loops because they extend the requirements on the player. There is more to do in the game and it's time limited. They can be easily scaled for all types of player engagement, thanks to the economy design of TrainStation 2, as I mentioned. They don't require coding because it's basically just a framework to add more content into the game, which is then removed. And they are time limited and then go away. So even if we mess something up like balance or a feature, 
it just goes away after one month and then you get to start over. So many game developers use this, but I think Pixel is, I don't know of many other companies that do such large events as we do, I think, and so frequently because it's, it takes up most of our production capacity most of the time, I would say. And uh, a huge benefit of events that they, they allow for topical offers like a Christmas offer, a Halloween offer, which will then go away. And this creates motivation for the player to spend before the valuable content is removed. And uh, this graph shows the impact of events on TrainStation 2. So event revenue is the blue one. So the by far the largest one. You can see a huge spike at the start of an event. And then they are like, uh, and even throughout the event, most of the revenue is connected in some way to the event happening. And it's mostly because of the unique content and time pressure. So if you have the capacity to produce events, I highly recommend it. Uh, I think it also has like from produc production point of view in Eastern Europe, it is cheaper to hire a lot of people to work on events than if we, maybe in Western countries. And that's why it is a good option for, uh, in our region. Mm -hmm. All right. So, uh, as I mentioned at the start, TrainStation it was considered a huge success, especially after adding events. And we wanted to capitalize on this success with another game. And we were thinking like, uh, what strategy to use to get another game that performs as well as TrainStation as quickly as possible, because the development of TrainStation 2 took about I think two years before release and then uh, another year before it got like running really, really well. So we wanted to shorten this production time significantly and we tried probably the cheapest option available and we did a 100% reskin of the game called Port City. So you probably understand what it's about. It's basically train station with all the mechanics that I mentioned before, but with the topic of ships. Uh, it was launched uh, last year, about one year ago. Uh, it uses the same game design, monetization, UX, and like the difference is really small. It was basically tweaks to make it work a bit better with ships because of the scaling and stuff like that. But the game is nearly identical to the point where we can share new features easily and also A-B test results. So if we test something on train station and works, they can implement it in Port City and so on. And the development was pretty short. It took, I think, less than a year. Uh, and it was mostly developing graphics and the framework for the game because all of our games are graphic intensive. So, oh, sorry. The development took half a year and then uh, it's been constantly being developed after a release. So significantly less than TrainStation 2. And we were hoping to achieve similar numbers to TrainStation 2 with this game because uh, we already had so much experience. And we also had experience with ship-based games because we did a similar game about six years ago, I think, <laughs> called Seaport. So, but that's not what happened. Uh, and this is how it looks like. So pretty similar to TrainStation, but with ships. So, and that's actually not what happened. Uh, so here is a comparison of KPIs for the first year uh, of Port City and Train Station in the same time frame. Uh, as you can see, the in-game parameters like retention and average revenue per user, so AR ARPU, are even better for Port City, either similar or better for Port City. However, the significant difference is in the marketing parameters, CPI, cost per install, and registrations so uh it might seem like a small difference the cpi uh, between 1.1 euro and 1.4 per player but you can you also need to like take into account that we were able to buy 11 million players or registrations at this price while we already got to 1.4 after 2.5 million registrations. so if we were to buy 11 million players for port city as well the price would go way go out, go way up so, and we started like analyzing this uh, shortly after release, like what could we do to improve the game and get it on track to be as popular as Train Station 2. So, as I mentioned, the game design is basically the same and the in-game parameters are quite similar. Um, 
but it's hard to get as many players into the game. So we were thinking like, what are the reasons? So uh, these are not confirmed. These are like our top hypotheses. So the first one is there, that there exists a smaller market audience for a ship themed game, you know, like trains are more popular. There just simply are more players that like to play free trains. Uh, then the second uh, hypothesis which we are working on is that we are using incorrect marketing creatives. So basically the ads the player sees for the game don't show things that they are interested in. It took us also quite a long time for Train Station 2 to figure out what to show in the ads for the game to be or for the ads to be attractive and have good KPIs. So this is something that we took our time polishing but after m more than a year I'm not sure if we can still get it right. And the third thing is that, uh, and like the strongest, or well, how would I say, the most troubling hypothesis is that just using a reskin and uh, changing a train game to a ship game creates a systemic problem because players who are interested in ships expect uh, like significantly different core gameplay mechanics from the game. So they might like ships, they might like the graphics and everything, but they come into the game and or what they see in the ads is not something that they want to play. So maybe they expect to be like uh, steering of the ships or maybe like high level management, but not the gameplay that we provide with the train station 2 design. And it's pretty difficult to change this at this point in the game development. So uh, the takeaway we took from this is that just simple reskinning, even though it's cheap and quick, uh, probably doesn't work for uh, complex games like Train Station or Port City. It might work for small games which have a short development time and you don't mind if some, uh, and you can produce many of them. But it uh, has not worked for us with a complex game with a long development time. And um, it's not that the KPIs are terrible, but they are simply not good enough to, for it to make sustainable and like a growing product for a long time compared to train station. Uh, we have also taken away that uh, each team must be very well researched for market potential. Um, it is still, po it might still be possible to produce a ship game that is as successful as train station, but uh, it might be it but probably not with these sort of mechanics. So uh, when we do the research of the team, we should also research like what are the mechanics that the players are most attracted to and include them into the game. So after this time, we still had the, so basically right now we still have train station, which is successful and we have learned a lot and we are still want to reuse the learnings we have from that game and also like use the development time to expand our portfolio of products and not just start over and spend another three years developing a brand new game with the risk of it not being successful. So we still want to use train station to design, but we need to uh, use another approach. And that's basically what we are trying to figure out right, right now with our next tycoon project. Uh, I would say that we are currently considering three possible strategies. Uh, for development, this is actually brand new from like the past month. So the first one I would say is called Reskin Plus. So it's not a pure reskin, but it's like using most of train station, but uh, fixing the worst or changing the worst parts. So we know the good and bad TS2 mechanics, which I have mentioned before. So it's this. So keep the good ones and try to fix the bad ones some other way. Uh, and then when we have like this, the game fixed, try to research a team that would work well with this sort of mechanics and just make another game. So that maybe we will work better than ships. Uh, the benefit of this strategy is that it would be the cheapest to do again, not as cheap as Port City, but, uh, still significantly cheaper than starting a new. And the risk is the same as with Port City that we might not be able to get the appropriate mix of team and mechanics and audience that would be required for the game to be successful. Mm -hmm. uh, another more aggressive strategy, even, uh, even despite the name is conservative growth. So 
that's basically starting not from the mechanics, but from the audience. We know the train station two audience, what it's like. It's mostly older males. They like uh, technology. They like relaxing games and so on. So we would try to make a game that is for this audience or a similar audience like this, but expand it. So it's probably true that there are more older males that like playing games. They are not interested in trains, but in something else or something similar like industry or what have you. So we would just take our TS2 audience insights and try to make an ideal game for this audience. So with the mechanics and topic and research it, research it based on what we know about the audience. And the first strategy we are considering is a radical innovation, I would call. We would be to make an ideal tycoon game. So like be more ambitious than with Train Station 2 and uh, try to deconstruct what we have learned from our one, two, three, four tycoon games so far and try to like distill it into an ideal product with an with ideal mechanics and uh, ideal team that would have the biggest market, market potential. Of course, everything would be researched and confirmed in market research before we start production. So this is for the risking. Uh, this is about the audience and I would like to talk about a bit more about uh, deconstructing tycoons, which is something we are working on, uh, despite or regardless of which strategy we choose for the future. We use something called motivators, which are sort of like the motivations for players to engage with the game. Um, they are based on uh, existing player typologies and it's like adjusted to fit our needs, I would say. So we have things like you want to grow, in the game that means uh, like expansion of your base from a small settlement to a huge city or a company from a small company to a huge one then there is uh, complete that means completing various quest lines achievements and stuff like that collect that means collecting trains uh, basically what train station 2 is about and you have some more exotic ones like self express that means like decorating layouts and expressing yourself in the game and there are also some like uh, react, which means that uh, being motivated by having a game which tests your reflexes. So like action games and stuff like that. And we have deconstructed this to figure out like what are the ideal motivators for a tycoon game. And we have basically come up with this. So uh, most tycoon, ga tycoon games are based on the grow motivator which means uh, expanding your base or your company. So this is a must have for each tycoon game. It must be strongly represented in the game. But also for free to play, it's relevant to have a complete motivator and collect to a lesser degree. Then there are secondary motivators, uh, which can be the unique selling point of the game. So not every tycoon game needs to have them, but we can use this to um, make the game more interesting. And then there are some we should really avoid, like React, because we know the older player base doesn't want too much stress from their game based on player research. We are also researching various topics for the game, but at this point, the new game could basically be about anything that works out. Uh, well, whether we find the ideal combination of motivators, mechanics, and, to and a topic, we will basically do the best possibility. And we are going everywhere from ancient history to space colonization, fantasy, whatever. There are also some production requirements for a tycoon game, for our next tycoon game. So shorter production time is the number one priority. Uh, we want the design less dependent on producing graphics, uh, modular maps, so they can be reused and maybe adjusted by a game designer, not a graphic artist, uh, also like modular assets. We want to have reusable assets between projects so it's easier to start a new with something new and lower team requirements and the point of this is to get more value from your work from your time and to be able to iterate and fail more quickly so even if a game isn't successful it doesn't take three years or maybe one year or half a year and we can move on to something else and that's basically the end of the presentation so i, I know it was probably a lot I usually get feedback that my presentations are too complex. So I hope you can like take away something with you. So the main takeaways from this are uh, it's key to have a deep economy and basically any sort of free to play game to be successful, uh, especially in the current market. 
you should uh, or the strategy for deep economy is to be able to squeeze as much value from your content as possible through economy design uh thirdly the design philosophy of fixing similar games like we did between train station one and two uh will probably might get you good results but it doesn't allow you like to identify a systemic problems of your design and you might get a good game you might get a bad game we were lucky in that case uh for designing from first principles which is like deconstructing tycoons which i talked about uh is good for you to understand systemic problems of a game genre but it you should merge it with previous experience otherwise the game might have too many unknowns so i would recommend like merging strategies three and four to make an ideal game and uh, finally our experience is that simple reskinning of complex games doesn't work and you should probably avoid it and that's about it thank you very much thank you uh, if you have any more questions after this you feel free to add me on linkedin i usually respond to game design related questions Yeah, hello, thank you for a beautiful lecture. Uh, I have one question about time-limited events. Uh, what approach do you use to maybe uh, you tested some approaches? How frequently time-limited events should be opened for your audience? Thank you. We have a lot of experience with this uh, because all of our games use events. And basically what we have found out is it's best to always have an event, maybe even more than one at uh, one moment. Uh, we also get feedback for this that it's too much, that our mid-core players uh, find it too stressful. But uh, the numbers show that the most engaged players enjoy this sort of uh, frequency. They just want, they just always want there something to be happening in the game. And it doesn't have to be like a brand new map or like something production heavy. You can just have like a competition or maybe cycle through a couple of smaller events but it's just nice to have always something happening in the game that isn't there afterwards because it uh, it's like watching a series having a new episode of a series i would say so i would say all the time thanks do you have any questions Uh, thank you. And uh, I have a question about how do you measure uh, if you add some content to, to the game, for example, events or uh, some new features, how do you measure if it's successful or not? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, do you measure it only by monetization or you track another metric uh, retention or something like this? Mm -hmm. um, it depends on the feature, of course. Uh some things like events are so obviously uh useful uh like you have like i don't know i would say like ten thousand revenue per day and after you add the re event it's like twenty thousand per day so you know it was a success but there are also many kinds like ux improvements which have other goals than monetization and we usually or almost always we follow a kpi goal either retention or monetization uh, average revenue if it's possible, we do an A-B test. We have a pretty robust A-B test system and we test almost everything. And if it's something in the late game, we try to define KPI goals as well and we just uh, measure it on a time scale. So uh, for instance, we are planning to add guilds to train station two for late game players. And we will basically like, just measure average revenue in the in like the quarter before and then after to see, and also have like, uh, the amount of players that are engaged with the feature will be relevant because sometimes you don't need to like make more money but just create something interesting for the players to stay in the game longer otherwise they might have left already um thank you for the presentation uh about the event um what's like optimal time for it for example like one week two week or something like that and do you see any like uh growth to the end maybe or do you put some kind of timer like to make uh people stress about it and get more involved in the event thank you mm -hmm. 
um, I think an ideal time uh, doesn't exist or for our smaller events we usually have them for like one week uh, there are also the competitions I mentioned which take like two or three days but they're like a feature not an event and for our big events they last one month and the reason for this is that we are unable to produce them more quickly so if we were, would be able to do them every three weeks or two weeks we probably would I'm not sure but um, this has been our main limitation and with regards to timers um, there's a timer in the event UI all the time but actually we don't do like um, creating stress in the players we only do like notification that the event has ended because otherwise they might forget to collect their rewards or be confused or something because they are the older guys but actually that's a good idea to maybe do we have some like uh, event-wide uh, competitions which end which reward the player at the end so naturally as the engineers they try to they focus on it more and there's like a, quite often there's like a pretty significant final um, finale for it so it's like the players are observing how the competition turns out but we don't stress them too much because of their age I think thank you